Welcome to Keto Life Support, where we make your keto life sustainable, fun, and low stress. I'm Kim Howerton, and I'll be coming to you weekly with some of my keto besties to bring you the practical, real-world keto advice that you need. Quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor, and even if we do have a doctor in the house from time to time, he or she is not your doctor, and nothing we say on this show should be taken as medical advice. Always check in with a trusted medical professional about your own personal medical concerns. Hello and welcome to Keto Life Support. I am Kim Howerton. This is episode number 143. And this is a new series I'm doing about weight loss maintenance. So join me today where we're going to be talking with my good friend, Amy Igis, who is a weight loss success story for sure. Also a coach with Dr. Tro and just an all-around fabulous human. So join me while we talk to Amy about her experience a little bit on the weight loss, but mostly about how she maintains her weight loss. You're going to find out some amazing things. You're going to find out just what a great person she is. So stay tuned for this episode. And also pay attention through the next few weeks to months when I roll out a bunch of other similar episodes where I talk to some of my good friends who are also often coaches or people who talk about keto or low carb and who've also lost significant amounts of weight and have managed to maintain that weight loss. So we're going to focus on maintenance in this series. So we'll call this the maintenance series. And I'll be coming to you regularly with these special episodes with people like Amy, with people like another Amy, Amy Berger. We got Nurse Cindy and a bunch more people are going to be joining me for this intermittent series. They won't all be in a row, but they're coming to you because I think maintenance is really one of the most important choices that we make on our journey. And really, it's not about the weight loss, right? That's important and very exciting. But if you can't keep it off, then losing it in and of itself is not as good. So let's talk about maintenance with Amy. Hello and welcome. I'm here with Amy, my good friend, Amy. Hello. Hi, Kim. How are you? Hey. I am well. And, you know, I could give a spiel about how wonderful Amy is because she is super wonderful. I've known her for years. She's actually one of my early clients for which I often apologize for some of the things I said before I was smarter. And <laughs> she is now a coach in her own right and very happily chugging along here. So, Amy, what do you want people to know about you? Give yourself a little intro. Sure, sure. So um, my name is Amy, as Kim said. Um, I credit Kim for giving me a world-class stellar education in um, all things keto and low-carb. She really gave me the foundation upon which I have been able to go on to lose over 220 pounds. Um, wow. Yeah. And the thing that I want people to know is this was not the life that I was destined to live or so it seemed, you know, and I made a hard left turn or a right turn at a certain point and went in a whole new direction. And if I can offer anything, if I have any superpower, it's that it's possible to do this because I really, 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 I cannot stress enough really how I did not believe it was possible. When you first started, you were about to get gastric bypass basically, right? Like some type of weight loss surgery. Yeah. Yeah. I had done all the diets. I had done all the programs. I had done intuitive eating. I had done health at every size, which I still, I very much believe, you know, all of those things get some parts of this right. They just don't, not, nobody gets all of it right, you know, <laughs> and they rarely get the nutrition part of it right. But yes, I was, I knew that bariatric surgery was the wrong choice for me, but I was so desperate and so just felt like I was in prison in in my body that I was about to go and do something really drastic. And I knew it was a, the wrong choice for me. But yeah, I did a random Google search. I came upon Diet Doctor, saw Kim's pretty little face on some random interview. and I was It like, was oh. so random. So <laughs> random. Yeah. Like yeah. Diet Doctor interviewed me like in a crowd at a thing. I think they said Dr. Kim Howerton. I was like, <laughs> No. Uh, 
Well, you know, uh, it's an honorary doctorate. <laughs> right, that's right. That's right. I have a world weary doctor. Anyway, and then Amy and I, I was like, how did you find me? And then we just hit hit it off for sure. So yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, so you've lost, you said over 220 pounds. I have. I that have. is amazing. You've lost more than a person. I have. I have. Uh, I have lost way more than I weigh now. And it is... Yeah. Um, it's inconceivable to me. I can even, it, it's just, I can't even wrap my head around it. Do you, still. when you look in the mirror, what do you see now? Uh, I see, you know, I, I, I've heard this said before. I didn't see myself before as yeah. I was, and I don't know that I see myself now. I am getting used to, as the mm -hmm. years go on, I'm getting used to what I see in the mirror now. I, um, I see, I don't know who I see. You know, that's a weird yeah. thing. You know, people don't really talk about that part of it. I'm getting used to it. I know yeah. that was really fairly you, articulate, but <laughs> Yeah, do you still take the wrong size into the dressing room when you're buying clothes? Well, you know, uh, since COVID, I do most of my shopping <laughs> okay. and I, I, <laughs> But um, I do look at my clothing sometimes. I'm like, this is never going to fit me. Or, you know, I... I hesitate to put things in the dryer and I'm like, oh, you could put it in the dryer. It's okay. You know, I have not stretched a waist out on a sweater in a long time. It's very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> or done the like tug, you know, that the tug. tug. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. I, um, I hear you. All right. So what I want to talk about today, because the people want to know it, okay. successful weight loss, like what is it? Let's just sum it all. What does it take? And then the bigger part. So we're not this, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But then the bigger thing is like the maintaining because I have heard, I think this is accurate, six out of seven people who attempt to lose weight, lose some weight, but most of them gain all or more of it back. So while I am concerned about the first one, which is what everyone talks about all the time, I'm actually more interested in the second part, which is the keeping it off. It's sort of like, you know, I talk to my mom friends. I'm not a mom, but I talk to my mom friends and they're like, everyone talks about the pregnancy. Everyone talks about the delivery, the delivery, the delivery, getting there. And then like, there aren't as many people talking about the like, now what? I've got a new being, right? Or like you plan for the wedding, but then you're like, oh, now I'm married, right? Like, so right. The after of it is as big a deal, if not a bigger deal than the during thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a, l a number of practical things, but also on a very theoretical level, like, you know, I woke up every day pretty much for my entire life. And my first thought was generally like, what are you going to do today to lose weight? Right? Yeah. Every day for 50 years. And yeah. then waking up and not having that worry anymore did create a little bit of a vacuum. Like, it's weird. What do I worry about now if I am not consumed with losing weight, the macros, the numbers, the calories, the points, the Weight Watchers points, like, what am I going to be obsessed about? And it was a little bit of a mind messed with my mm -hmm. mind a bit for a little while there. And it's something I still grapple with, you know, I still have to keep it in check. You know, it does create an empty space. And mm -hmm. I can see how maybe that empty space would people who fill it with food, you know, or the, the right. old things that fill right. it. Those right. Yeah. I mean, that that up and down and up and down, the constant mm -hmm. up and down of the weight. So, you know, when you are binging or eating, however, however, your eating is not properly arranged in the before times, there's a constant dopamine situation going on where you're like mm -hmm. seeking food, planning food, getting food, acquiring food, eating the food. Right. So you're always on this roller coaster. And I feel like a lot of people replace that with the dieting, the weight loss. Sure. So now they're getting the dopamine hits from the seeing the scale go down, planning the macros. So it's like it's just one addiction has been replaced with another addiction. Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's this kind of a vacuum in it in the place where you're like, I don't really have weight to lose or not much anyway. Yeah, I did for a while replace that. I still do to a degree. I replaced it with exercise and kind of mm -hmm. pushing myself on that front. And now I'm, you know, I've become so busy with work that I have, um, don't really have as much time to exercise as much as I had been. And so I'm trying to kind of mellow into the whole Zen, you know, this <laughs> is me, Amy 2.0. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, 
you went keto, you mm-hmm. lost a bunch of weight. Was there an initial approach and then a later approach or was it pretty smooth sailing? Like just a summary, like what was the weight loss like sure. for you? So um, when you and I first started working together, I was brand, brand new at this. Yeah. And I there was a, so much conflicting information online and it was do this and this, this macros and that. And I was so confused. You gave me a world-class education in how to low carb and macros and where carbs lie and, and all of that good stuff. And also in seed oils and ingredients and things like that, which was has been really instrumental. It was like really that you gave me the foundation. And I lost, I would say, over two years. I think it was lost about 80 pounds or so, maybe 90 pounds. And I started to dabble more and more. And I started to kind of like play around with it. And I could tell that it was headed in the wrong direction. Like mm-hmm. I could there was like a stall, and then maybe a, you were felt a drift coming. It wasn't really a stall because a stall, oh. I think, would be if had I been keeping low carb, you know. Uh, oh, you like, were probably, you were yeah. off the off the plan back and forth. Entirely off, but it was just like it wasn't just like my birthday and maybe Christmas. It was right. oh, it's like you know, I don't Not know. Not friends. Exactly. Tuesday. It's yeah. a day in singing why, you know. It is just, Taco Tuesday. It, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and it became a, a more slippery slope. And I just, I started to put back on a little bit of weight. And I, I was gripped with that panic that anybody that has lost weight feels like they can, it's like you can't stop the train from going. And I, at the time, was working for a nonprofit organization. And I was at low carb Denver. Um, and I needed, I live in New York, near outside of New York City, and I needed a doctor. And I met Dr. Tro there. And he is local to the New York area. And I needed a doctor. And I just needed some accountability in person, yeah. somebody to like, you know, to get weighed in. And, and I just needed like, I needed all of it, you know, and I could feel that it was headed in the wrong direction. So I met him there at low carb Denver in 2019, I think it was. And he became my doctor. And he taught me like a little bit of a a different way of doing low co- and keto than um, I had been doing with you, which was really instrumental because when I was with you, I, I pretty much was tracking and weighing and measuring, which was yeah. really helpful for me in the beginning. Um, yeah. But what I realized about myself is that I I had transferred my obsession with Weight Watchers points to, um, <laughs> the macros. to macros. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And so yeah. I wasn't, if I had like, you know, and I did just did 20 grams of total carbs at that point and including vegetables and, you know, green leafy vegetables. And if I had, you know, three grams of carbs left over at the end of the day, I ate them. And I remember one time I had to throw my, my food logs very meticulously, you know, weighed and measured and counted. And he kind of looked at them and he was rather disinterested, which is really uncharacteristic of him, you know. And he looked at me, he just like kind of tossed him aside and he was like, he's like, well, are you hungry? And it literally was like, what do you mean? <laughs> How is that relevant? Right? Like, what do you, like, what do you care if I'm hungry or not? And it was like, it was really kind of a tectonic shift in my, mm-hmm. which is interesting because I had done so much work around intuitive eating, it never dawned on me. And, huh. and you could ask me those questions too, but I guess it just took, Yeah. I think one thing that I, I have now is perspective and all things come in time, right? Like you learn the lesson when you're ready. Well, to yeah, I think, I think like one of the things not, please stop me if I'm sharing something you don't want shared. But um, when we were working together, there was a lot of push pull around your desire to still be able to include mm-hmm. the parts of your old life that yeah. you weren't quite ready to let go of. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I when I first, came across Diet Doctor, I was convinced that I was going to just do keto and put the macros into my Weight Watchers, like do keto and mac- and Weight Watchers at the same time, somehow right. like track side by side. Uh-huh. Like I was, I still, even now, I have to fight the inclination to go back to Weight Watchers. Like it's, it's crazy. I joined I Prince Young. Young. I don't know what that is. I don't know either. It's like, I, I so buy into some part of me still buys into like this moderation is the is the way the thing yeah. it's the smart way to go i mean i joined my orchards 35 times like it was <laughs> not the smart way to go if it was smart i would have only had to have joined once <laughs> it's insane 
It's right. so entrenched, though, you know. And right. so you're right. I, I was really, um, I was trying to kind of keep to the old way, and um, I, I wasn't ready to just give up. That it was um, right. It was, and I think not to interrupt you, but I was going to say to the people like listening, this is part of the process. Mm-hmm. Like it is the rare person who like they make one change and everything is magically perfect. Like it's, oh, that didn't work. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, let me go this way. Like yeah. It is a journey. Like you're in school for 18 years. You're in a relationship. You know, it's like everything worth doing, you're going to do badly until you do it better. Yeah. I think in some ways, and this is so, so hard for people to do. And I don't know that I, I don't think I realized this until kind of fairly recently, but mm-hmm. um in some ways, I feel like the last thing you should be focused on is actually weight loss. Mm. Uh, and nobody wants to hear that, right? No, like, no one. No, no one, one wants to hear that. No. And I know, know that I would have stuck with it if somebody had said that to me. But the truth is, I think we all need to focus on the things that will make us better and stronger and healthier. And that stuff brings weight loss with it. Yeah. You can't really control the number on the scale, certainly not day to day. You can only control the behaviors that over time bring the weight loss. It's kind of like the a, a fake it till you make it thing, you know? Right. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. If you don't do the work along, at least along the way, at least as equally important as the weight, you probably won't lose the weight. And if you do lose the weight, you won't keep it off. The other stuff, the rewiring your brain, fixing your habits, all those things are the things that are going to get you where you need to go and keep you there. And if you don't change elementally who you are in these areas, mm-hmm. um, you're just setting yourself up. Yeah, I think that truthfully is the long term work here. I mean, you know, I could lose weight and I have lost weight on every diet, but correcting course on a really deeply flawed relationship with food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is really the name of the game here. And that's still the long-term work for me. I mean, I still battle it. You know, I still, uh, I am not cured or healed. I think I very much identify as a food addict, although that is not an officially recognized diagnosis. I, you know, you don't tell an alcoholic that they can drink just a little bit, you know? Um, And so for me, keto and low carb is, a way to heal, help heal a relationship with food that is really problematic. Right. But it's not, I don't think it's ever going to be completely over. So I keep working it. Right. I think this ties into a point that I think is important, which is I, and I believe you, grew up in a way where we did not have a healthy food environment around us, you know, not just in our personal lives, but in our, just the world in general. But, you know, throughout my growing up, I had no idea what a healthy relationship with food was supposed to look like. And I thought, I hear this from my clients, so I would definitely want to talk about it, which is, and I'm sure you hear it from your clients, which is, I don't understand why I can't be normal and eat like normal people eat, to which I've now learned, I don't think you're thinking of normal people. There are a few genetic anomalies who have just incredibly fast metabolisms and are the far outlier that can eat in a certain way that is actually very unhealthy. And they're just just on the far end of a spectrum. But that what true healthy eating looks like is not well modeled in the world. Yeah, I think there's two issues here. One is you're talking about metabolic wellness. Yeah. But there's also like this deeply ingrained fail for decades, quote unquote fail at for decades at diet. What does that do to your psyche, right? And oh, what yeah. does that do? To, and then how does that how can you be normal when you have 50 years for me it was 50 years of fail culture? Yeah, diet culture, always being on or off a diet, completely all or nothing, you know, learned helplessness, like, of course, this is going to fail. And, I, and that's what happened. Right. And that food and weight, those are that's like immediately one is the other, like equated mm-hmm. rather than food and health. 
Right. And yeah. I was so disconnected from all of that without when Tro looked at me and he said, to me, are you hungry? I was like, how is that relevant? But he was an obesity weight loss doctor. Right. Of course, that, that should be, that is entirely right. relevant. And no doctor of the hundreds of experts that, quote unquote, experts that I've been to, or that my parents took me to as a kid, nobody had ever even, no doctor had ever asked me that, you know? And so we're so divorced from that. So you're right. Like, what is normal, right? Like, right. Um, and then, you know, I grow up in a food environment where we're told to just eat low fat and skim milk and pretzels and pasta and a box of snacks. But here's food. a treat. And it's the holidays. So you should have four plates of Thanksgiving mm-hmm. dinner. And like, it's just, it's like ping pong crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, as I said before, you know, if an alcoholic went to their friends or family and said, I have a problem with alcohol, nobody would say, oh, here's just a little bit. It's the holiday. Start again on right. Monday. Right? right. But you tell somebody that you're not eating carbs and people lose their minds. They're like, right. I could never give up my bread. My right. bread. <laughs> right. It's hard <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like there was a moment when it clicked for you or maybe just a progression where you weren't willing to trade anything for how good you felt compared to how you used to feel? Well, there's a couple of moments like that throughout the process. The first was after the first couple of weeks when Mm. I hadn't lost, you know, I certainly, I was staring down the barrel of of needing to lose over 200 pounds. So I certainly didn't lose enough in the first couple of weeks to make that much of a difference in that regard. Right. But I could feel there was something different. Now I understand the glycemic variability and mm-hmm. all that and what that was doing to my hunger and cravings and all of that. So there was that part of it. That was early on and that made me just keep going with it. And then I think there was a certain amount of, you know, when I had started to really lose significant amounts of weight, I was like, oh, I'm actually doing this, right? I had gotten that, further than that I had ever disbelief, gone. Disbelief, right? Yeah, and so I started to have some wind in my sails, and then I start. I did start exercising about really in earnest, like about two years in, maybe two and a half years in, and I started to really enjoy that and feel good and like moving my body. And then I, I started running, you know, which was I mean the first time I ran a mile, I was like with tears down my eyes, like I remembered like being. In behind my junior high school in the, at the track and not being able to barely walk a mile, let alone run a mile. And so there were those kind of things that those things have filled the vacuum that we talked about earlier. Yeah. A little bit in terms of, um, you know, what do I obsess about now that I don't worry about the food as much? It's just pushing myself to feel better and continue to like enjoy this newfound life that I have. Yeah. That's so good in your weight loss journey. You reach that point, you started working with Tro, you were like, hunger, crazy. All right, let's think about this. How do I feel? Did you change your focus then? What did your focus become? I did. I started to focus more on less on, well, less on counting and less on tracking and more on, are you hungry? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And kind of dipping back into like the stuff that I had learned with intuitive eating, which I think they really, I think intuitive eating is Fantastic. I just don't think that they, it is nearly impossible to do intuitive eating when you are riding a blood sugar roller coaster right. of hunger, constant hunger and cravings. Right. Right. Um, and also in the setting of like all this processed food, even the keto processed foods, you know, it's really hard to keep in touch with what's going on when you're just, you're like this food is designed in a lab. And right. I'm not saying I don't eat it, you know, and I'm right. like, it serves its purpose, right? But you got to um, go into it with your eyes open. Yeah. 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 In, in general, if a food makes me, and this is a lesson that I keep having to learn, but in general, if a food makes me hungrier to eat more of it, I try to avoid it unless it means I'm going to eat the higher carb version of it. And then it's a win. You right. know, it's, it's a context driven thing. So I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. I think I think it's absolutely true that any food, like for a lot of us that are more challenged in our ability to lose and maintain weight, uh, you know, metabolically or historically, I think there are some real basics about hunger and fullness that we struggle with. And you getting in touch with that is really important. And then getting really in touch with which foods make me fuller and which foods make me hungrier 
it's interesting because sometimes I know people who have trouble keeping weight on and it's almost easier to explain it to them. And then I was like, wait, the reverse is true Mm. or the opposite. It's like, you know, concepts of volume and chewing and, you know, versus smaller volume. And so there are things you can do to encourage fullness and things you can do to discourage fullness and junk foods are the kinds of foods that encourage not fullness. They discourage fullness. Yeah. 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 And, you know, some, an an argument that I get into with not an argument, but, uh, you know, it's sort of one of the things that I have heard people say is like that keto or low carb, you know, gets rid of your hunger. And that is certainly true, right? Your appetite does go down. Appetite diminishes. Yep. But, that doesn't necessarily mean that your drive to eat diminishes, right? Right. And that drive to eat is, there's so many factors that go into that. I mean, there's social cues. There's a Starbucks and a pastry place. on. I mean, I live in New York City. There's every corner, there's there's a reason to eat or things that drive us to eat. And so when I said before, if a food makes you hungry, but also if a food drives me to eat more of it versus like, my turnoff switch for baked goods, whether they're low carb or not, is nearly non-existent. But right. like, I can't really eat more than a pound or so of meat, you know? So right. um, it's a lesson I learn. Oh, I need to learn over and over again. I still make the mistake regularly, but I yeah. keep I keep learning. I keep showing up. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I always like, well, sometimes say, not always. It's not like constant. And it's like learning to walk is about falling and catching yourself. When you're like a baby, they're falling, they're catching yourself. And if you think about it, that's what walking still is. It's just we're now so adept at it that we don't notice we're falling. We're, you know, the next step is happening. It's not a problem if you trip a little bit. It's how you catch yourself. So you're learning that there's probably going to be testing the waters every once in a while, right? Because you live in a society where these things are, I mean, I get these things sent to me and I'm like, oh no, I have a lot of brownies in my house. So uh, I guess my point is, I think it's a good thing that you're constantly having to learn another little bit and a little bit and a little bit. I'll tell you one thing that I have learned that I really do think is instrumental in the fact that I am on this side of my weight loss journey is that when I do fall, it doesn't become... I'll start over again on Monday mm-hmm. or some arbitrary date on the right. calendar or after January, the holidays, after the yeah. holidays. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I lived an entire five decades of everything from October through January 1st. <laughs> it's right. like after the holidays. So that's a third of a year or it was that a quarter of a year. So, I mean, I don't do that anymore. And that has yeah. been huge. Like I am the one thing that I tell people that I work with now is like, you are literally one meal away from getting back on track. Don't fall into that all or nothing. Like I'll start over again on some random date. And then the other thing is, is if I am hungry, I like, it's so counterintuitive to that diet culture, but it's just eat more, like just make yourself a giant plate of eggs and bacon or steak and just reset yourself on that way. Instead of like waiting till Monday and, or doing some 84 hour fast. Right. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the other thing I think that are you hungry question can help with a lot is I think the fact that I grew up in this, like eat just enough, don't overeat, eat small meals, right? This like restrictive mindset led me and many people to under eat which then led them to overeat when they could no longer stop the floodgates. And so actually getting nourished is what our body is looking for. Yeah. 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 It's um, when you eat to satiety, which is not the same as fullness. It's sort of a, I don't know how you really define that. I guess it's It's, sort of a mental and a physical thing, right? Right. But at the same time, I mean, okay, I'm going to, let's get to this point because I think it's important, which is, I think I was trained to think of satiety when I was doing Weight Watchers, right? Like in my past as just no longer being starving. (laughs) That's the greatest goal you could think of for yourself. I'm no longer so hungry. I can't think of anything but food. I have a little bit of brain power. Not sad that we all live like that for so long. I have memories of sliced tomatoes being like, oh my God, I can have some tomatoes and and then I won't be so starving. Anyway, um, it's a wonder I actually still like tomatoes. Uh, But 
I think getting to know what satiety really is, is actually a super worthwhile thing to invest in. Yeah, for sure. And what that kind of goes back to what I said before about there being certain foods that just, they don't give me fullness and they don't give me satiety. And, you know, even like low carb baked goods to a degree, nuts are like that for me too. Like there is, I could eat my body or my former body weight in nuts while I'm preparing dinner. And it has no bearing on the amount of dinner that I eat. Like it doesn't ever give me any fullness or satiety. Yeah. Um, and just so, a vaguely nauseous feeling, right? Like yeah. I, I can eat nothing until I feel sick, but I can't, I don't feel necessarily satisfied. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so um, I think there's certain foods, like for me, if I don't have meat every couple of days, I don't feel satiated with my food. It's sort of an indefinable quality that, um, that I have just come to kind of, it goes back to that intuitive eating. Like I know it when I feel, feel it. it. Yeah. yeah. What? role did fasting play in your weight loss and what role does it play these days? Yeah. So I pretty early on, I I started skipping breakfast. I did bulletproof coffee for a little bit. And then eventually I kind of lessened that and lessened the fat and that and lowered it and lowered it. I still don't do black coffee, but don't tell anyone, you know, I kind of have a sort of a, a mixed feeling about fasting in general. On one hand, when I was I feel like it, for me, it kicked in a little bit of a deprivation cycle early on. And it made me feel like, oh, this keto thing, you know, where I was feeling satiated, all of a sudden the rug felt like it was a little bit taken out from under me. Like, oh, this is, oh, I recognize this deprivation cycle, right? I lived this for a long time. It felt like a a bit of a setup. Exactly. Like, it was like kind of like Lucy and um, Charlie Brown with the football, like, (laughs) you know, I call it the bacon switch. (laughs) <laughs> right, like the bait and switch, like they promised me bacon and now I've got nothing. <laughs> and now I got nothing for 48 hours. Um, but there was a certain point where I just was like, let me try this thing. Because really, when I started to pay attention to hunger, and the truth is, there was often days that I wasn't as hungry and I was eating because it was 12 o'clock and that's when I ate lunch for my entire life, you know? And so I started to play around with it. There was a while there where I was doing like one forty-eight hour fast sometimes, you know, a couple of times a month or um, I don't do them very often now. Now I kind of do I sometimes one meal a day, sometimes two meals a day, sometimes three, you know, sometimes I have a low carb grazing day, but I really try not to do that because that gives me no satiety either. It's just, right. you know, for whatever cir- the circumstances, it's better to do that than the high carb alternatives. But I recognize that fasting is a great tool for people. I have heard it said that fasting should be an expression of non-hunger. And I wish that I was that evolved, <laughs> but I don't ever, I don't think it will ever, ever feel normal to me not to eat. Mm. Uh, so I have to kind of work on that relationship to food issue. Like the question, it begs the question, if I'm not eating when I'm not hungry, what's going on? And if I can do that, if I can answer that question without kind of judgment and shame and like, what's wrong with you, you know, I can say, oh, you know what? You're really not hungry for lunch now. So let's, let's push it in out a couple of hours. I might be putting words in your mouth. Please correct me if I have. But I, what I'm hearing is kind of like, you're not so into fasting as a thing. You're into not eating if you're not hungry. Yes. Yes, for sure. For sure. I mean, I my ego kind of played around with the fasting for a little while. I think it, it went into that whole sort of like... How long is your fast? Yeah, I do this and let me try it. And this is a challenge and let me get into it. And, um, you know, had, like it went along with the running, like how fast can I run? I mean, I'm still such a, I mean, people walk way faster than I run, but, um, <laughs> but it kind of, there's a little bit of an ego thing there. Sure, um, sure. I think there's more than one way to, to do this. Yeah. And not everybody has to fast. Although I think probably two meals a day is a safe bet for most people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Once, once they're low carb for a while. Sure. So if someone came to you and said, what do you think is the key or keys or like, what do I need to know about maintaining a large weight loss? Um, That it is a process that I work at it, but sometimes the work, like the volume button of the work is at a 10, but most of the time, the volume button of how hard the work is, is lower. You know, it's at mm-hmm. like a one or two. But I also, at this point, put a lot of things in place in my life to mm. make the work not quite so much work. I am always prepared with food. I do not go to a family gathering without a low-carb dessert. 
I keep some low carb meat sticks in my purse because I don't want to get stuck out there, you know, without something safe. And even though I'm not hungry for them, I just feel better knowing that they're there. I always have, you know, hard boiled eggs and burgers and chicken cooked in my fridge almost at all times. So there's just things that I have kept, I keep in place to make it easy for myself. Yeah. And I, I really try not to fall into that like perfectionist all or nothing thing because I lived that cycle for years and, you know, with all comes nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So you still do some meal prep, you make sure you have food options, you know what you're getting into at social engagements. Do you still like review menus if you're going to a restaurant ahead of time that you've never been to? I do. Every yeah. time. Every yeah. time. I mean, I know that there's pretty much, there's very few restaurants that I can't mm -hmm. find what to get, but I also don't want to not enjoy my food. So if there's okay. not going to be something I'm going to enjoy there, I will just say, can we go somewhere else? <laughs> right. right. Um, yeah. I still work it. I really yeah. do. It's easier. It's not as much work as I said, but it's, I do make sure that, you know, my needs are covered. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, is I exercise now for mental health, but I think that, you know, it is helping me maintain my weight loss probably, but it is an also, that is an expression of being able to move freely in a body that can so yeah. long, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, some of the things you're touching on are what studies sort of show that exercise helps a lot of people with long-term maintenance. But the thing that they talk about isn't the calorie burn. It's the mental health aspect of the exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. For sure. Yeah. I found that out early, you know, with COVID when in New York City, when we were shut down. Mm -hmm. And I think the days that I really kind of my, my mental health really suffered were the days that I didn't work out. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, like when the gyms were shut and, and there was just nothing open, I was like, oh, those were the days that I just kind of really, it's like, oh God, I'm losing my mind here. Right. Um, and so now and I somebody, make sure that exercise every day. Yeah. And as somebody in a bigger body, the thought of exercise being something that felt like something I wanted to do was very foreign to me. So did you transition with that mentally? Yeah. You know, I had actually exercised even when I was. Over oh, really? Okay. Pounds. I not, you know, I went through, I, I kind of went through phases with it, but I was very fortunate to find a gym that catered to people of all sizes when mm -hmm. I was at my highest weight. So I had enjoyed that, but then I had really, it was, again, it was all or nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when I had picked it up again and I started to, I don't know, there was just some wind in my sails and I was at, I was down about a hundred pounds at that point. And I started to just enjoy different kinds mm -hmm. of exercise. And I started taking like rowing classes. And I remember you were really into rowing for a while. Yeah. 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 I still do it at home, but um, yeah, I no longer go to the gym. The gym is that I was doing it and changed with COVID and it wasn't as great, but I do enjoy it. I love, I really love that I can run. I don't, I hate the first 15 minutes of it every time. <laughs> and I have to remind myself every time, but I really I can't believe that I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, um, it's something I'm very proud of, you know? So, uh, awesome. yeah. So I've had to shift in terms of it, but I don't ever say, oh, I'm so excited to work out today. I'm always excited to finish the workout. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, we focus on all sorts of things, right? With the weight loss and the, like the food and, you know, you've mentioned a couple of foods that are good for you and, if you had it to do over again, the weight loss, do you think you would, this is maybe a not fair question because we're all on a journey, but like if you could go back and tell yourself something or some things earlier in your journey, what things would you tell old Amy? Calm the hell down. <laughs> <laughs> like just chill out. It's going to be okay. I would have said, you're not going to be perfect, but you're going to make it. I had no reason to believe that at the time. Mm -hmm. So it would have fallen on deaf ears, but I would have told myself, pay attention to hunger, pay attention to like that food relationship more. It isn't just about macros and, you know, how many carbs you ate in a day. I could break low carb, you know, I could break 
in the same way that I broke low fat with pasta yeah. and pretzels and snack wells, you know, it doesn't matter what diet you're doing, just pay attention to how you're feeling and your hunger. And yeah, but I probably would have started with chill out, lady. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. I think, I think it is hard. I mean, I know that feeling you mentioned earlier in this talk, which was the disbelief started to fall away a little bit at some point. And it is very hard. I think when you have a lifetime of what feels like diet failure to get to a place where you can believe in yourself. And that is something that takes some time. Yeah. And even now, I'll be honest with you, even now, if I put on a couple pounds, I'm like, oh, I had a good run here, but it's all coming back. (laughs) So that's a good thing to bring up. Your weight fluctuates now, right? It does. You know, well, I mean, it fluctuates. Yeah, or 10 pounds. Tell me what it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's about 10. I go up and down like 5, 10 pounds. Right now I'm about 5 pounds up from my lowest. And it's so interesting to me because any more than 5 pounds, like before, if I lost even 20, nobody, my my clothing size didn't change for the first right? 40, 50 pounds. I don't know. Right? And now like 10 pounds makes a big difference in it. My pants I- are tight. What's yeah, happened? Yeah. 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 Um, and so that's a weird thing. But yeah, my weight sort of fluctuates, but I'm pretty much holding steady, you know, plus or minus five to 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, um, it's crazy, right? Like I yeah. have from season to season now, you know, I live in a part of the world where we have four seasons, yeah, seasons. and from yeah. season to season, my clothing still fits. Now yeah. that that's never been, you know, I've never had that experience from winter to winter that the same clothing fits. So it, that part's nice too. <laughs> it helps. How do you manage your weight now? Do you weigh yourself? Do you take measurements? You're not tracking macros like you used to. What do you do to keep a track of what yeah. your body's doing? You know, she said, I work for Dr. Tro and there's a body composition scale in the office and once a month or now I'm trying to lose a little bit of weight. So I'm, as you would say, I'm in a little bit of a cut. So I will get on the scale like once every two weeks or once a mm-hmm. week now. And normally I get on the scale about once a month. I can, t- because my clothing is the same. It's fitted now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I can sort of use that and I can sort of use the clothing as a gauge. And I know how I've been eating, you know, if I'm eating too many like low carb cookies or, you know, more cheese and, you know, eating a little more, doing a little more grazing. Um, I know how I'm eating if I'm honest with myself, but I still like to weigh in at least once a month just to get a sense of, of where I am. Usually sometimes a little more often. And yeah, I, I, I go through, that's one of the things I'm always amazed that you, I'm so impressed that you do is that you do this experimentation with yourself. <laughs> um, and, uh, I don't have the fortitude. <laughs> <laughs> I just am, I just have a really bad case of ADHD is more what it's about, Amy. And I need to keep it shaking things up or else I get bored. Really? That's so interesting to me. Yeah. For me, it kicks in some of the diet stuff. Uh, uh-huh. So uh-huh. I have I'm to sure it that. does. I have to. Yeah. Well, not everything I do is sane, but you know. So when you are like, ooh, things are a little off track, what changes do you make to get you to rein things back in? So I, um, I do what I said a little bit earlier, which is I eat more. So mm-hmm. I go to two to three fairly sizable low carb meals for a little bit, let my hunger kind of dial down again, make sure that I'm full and satiated and kind of reset in that way, as opposed to going to fasting. Although I have thrown in occasionally, I do the opposite of what I tell uh, everybody that I work with to do, which is, you know, white knuckle it through a fast. I have done that. I don't recommend it. I don't think it's healing any flawed relationship with food. But do but we I all do something do. dumb every once in a while. Yeah, all yeah. but I, I go to eating more, not yeah. less. And then yeah. two to three days of that in general. And my hunger starts to dial back and I go back to doing my one and a half meals a day ish. Right. So you start to sort of crowd out the snacky, more junk foody stuff. You when you say you eat more, you mean you eat more whole foods. I eat more whole foods. I eliminate snacking. I try to do really sizable meals. Um mm-hmm. And yes, whole foods. I get rid of like all the anything in a package pretty much because it's just they drive me to eat more. You know, this time of year, those things are a win, right? Like, you know, we're surrounded by just junk everywhere we go. So 
those foods are fine for now. They keep my blood sugar fairly steady. And while they do make me eat more, they don't make me eat as much as the right. higher carb alternatives. But mm -hmm. yes, definitely whole foods, eliminate snacking and make and prepare and eat double or triple what I normally think I would so that I don't kick in deprivation. I come from right. a place of abundance and the food's not going anywhere. And then I kind of, my nervous system kind of settles down. I'm like, oh, you can, you can feel your hu true hunger again. Yeah. And I can feel my sort of like all or nothing. Oh my God, winner take all feeding frenzy, just like kind yeah. of fall away. And it's just like, oh, I feel this. I recognize this. I'm okay. Okay, got it. That sounds great. Anything else that you feel like around this topic you think people should know? Oh, God, there's a lot. I think, um, oh, God, don't compare yourself to anybody else's journey. Like, also, stop looking at people's well-curated Instagram feeds. Right. You know, and the other thing is, you know, I have a really dramatic before and after picture. But everybody's before and after picture. What exactly. it doesn't show is the minutia of the day in day out it is not always a dramatic thing it's like really right. just that was also something hard for me to understand when i started working with clients and patients oh there was a lot of just minutia of the day in day out right it's just sometimes it's just like eggs and eggs and let's it's not that on. exciting you know, it's, yeah it's not yeah. that exciting but one foot in front of the other you know do the things that you need to do and the scale will move and you will have that dramatic picture. But the picture doesn't show the like day in, day out work that really goes into it. And don't compare yourself to anybody else because, you know, you don't know where they started, what's going on under in their lab work, what's what kind of traumatic history they have or you have, you know, it's just. Right. Yeah, totally. There is this thing that you never expect that you lose the weight and people are like, oh, my God, come on, guys. But then like, now this is just you. There is no more like after. It's, you're like, I am just during. It is during. It was during yeah. then. It's during now. And you have to be okay with who you are without the, like, you don't have to be like, I used to look like this. Like every time you totally. meet somebody to totally. like justify <laughs> yourself. Yeah. Somebody said to me a couple of months back. Uh, and well, I think also it's kind of interesting that, you said something before about how losing mm. weight is a dopamine hit, right? Yes. I think the compliments are also a dopamine hit. Yes. And when those fall yes. off, you're like, what? Yes. Nobody's giving right. me adulation. These are a size go. 10 pants, everybody. Like, yes. hello, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but, you know, a good friend of mine from college said to me a couple of months back, I haven't seen her in a while. And she's like, you know, Amy, if I met you today, your weight would be like not even in the top 20 things of things that I would think about you and it literally like floored me like I couldn't even I it was unfathomable to me like that that wouldn't be the first word that somebody would use to describe me and that's a weird thing for me you know for, it was just I have been overweight since I was I mean I I've told this story before I, I think I told it on your podcast when I was on the last time I was at like three or four I tagged along to a weight watchers meeting with my mom yeah. And the woman that weighed in my mother spelled something that started with an O when she looked at me. And I remember asking, I was, I couldn't read, I couldn't spell, but I remember asking uh -huh. my mother a word that started with an O that, that meant fat. You know, I knew she was already calling yeah. me fat. So that's mm. how long. Mm. But to not look at myself through that lens that I've looked at myself right. at 50 years is like, whoa, like that's right. a wacky, wacky thing. Right. To like, how do I describe? I'm a tall brunette. I'm not like, if I'm like somebody that have to describe me in the crowd, like mm -hmm. before I can be like, I am the large brunette. Right. Not like, uh, I used yeah. to be yeah, like, but now I'm keto blonde. So I could have said I was the yeah. tall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, now blonde. I'm keto blonde. Now you go, nobody tells you when you go low carb that your hair goes blonde. <laughs> well, yeah, it just isn't natural. Mine. Yeah. I, I am bucking the trend, but, um, but I'm joking, people. Uh, yes, yeah. it is. It's bottle blonde. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Not well, keto blonde. <laughs> it could happen. Okay. I think that was super helpful for everybody. I think you gave a really good perspective because a lot of people come to me and are like, how do I even do this if I don't want to track? And I think it takes all kinds to know what the right approach for everybody is. So I love your hunger-based approach. And I should say that very occasionally I will take a yeah 
Cage from the Kim Howerton School of uh, Tracking. Or tracking or just sort of figuring out what's going on here. And I will, if I change something up, I will track for a little bit. Yeah. But I quickly let it fall away after I'm kind of in a new routine because it's because we not- eat in a routine pattern, right? It's not yeah. new. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For the most part, my food is pretty basic and, and I keep, I like it a little bit boring yeah. for the mo- most of the time. And then if I start to kind of pay a little closer attention to what other people are eating, I'm like, oh, now it's time to make a really over the top decadent keto version of something or other. Keep so I don't need to track burgers and you know, any of that stuff. A four ounce burger is a four ounce burger is a four ounce. But yeah, it's like rinse and yeah. repeat, you know, or six or eight yeah. or whatever. Yeah. All right. Well, that's awesome. Amy, if people want to learn more about you, your journey, that maybe they want to work with you, how can they find you? Yeah, so you can find me through Dr. Tro's practice, Dr. Tro, spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-T-R-O.com. You can find me there. We have an awesome app. There's a community chat and a bunch of free resources on there that I'm very proud of that we've all put together, and it's an amazing resource. Um, I have a bunch of blog posts on there. They can read about my story on there. I'll put links um, in. Yeah, that's great. And um, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm, I, I'm less and less on social media, although I just because it's just um, just a time suck. But I recognize that it's good to get the message out there. But yeah, I'm on Twitter, Amy D A M Y D E E one zero zero one. My old AOL name, which I probably I'll put a link in. Thank you, Kim. I know. It's- <laughs> All right, Amy. Well, this has been super helpful. And if you think of anything else that you didn't say, just let me know and I'll add it in. Um, But I think getting examples of long-term success, I think we need more of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Keto Life Support. Want more information? Want show notes? Want to suggest a topic? Just head over to ketolifesupport.com. That's where all that kind of thing can go on. By the way, I have a request. If you could go to your podcast host and hit subscribe, we would really, really appreciate it. And what would be even more awesome is if you could write a review. And what would be even more awesome than that is if you could write like a really flattering review. Just asking, you know, you do you. All right. So thanks so much for joining us. I'm thrilled that you're part of the Keto fam. Talk to you.